Hi, hello everyone, and I'm Xinpeng Li. Today, I will give a presentation about the simultaneous functional pipe and the functional MRI from data perspective. Uh, firstly, I will give a brief review of functional MRI, then the motivation of PIET. I will talk about why we need FPIET and how it works, and what it what it the what, what signal of iPad looks like, and then I will present some uh, analysis methods of PIDE, and especially by a focus on the data driven methods developed by uh, our group. And then I will move to the uh, analysis methods for drawing FPIDE and fMRI. Later, in the, in the, uh, finally, I will discuss some current challenges and future de development of fMRI and FPIDE. FMRI is a very mature technique, and firstly, let's have a quick review of the physiological and physical process of MRI. Uh, we can see we can see from here, and here's the neuron, and there's an activity happens in the neuron, and when the neuron is active, the hormonodynamic response uh, allows more blood flow uh, delivered to the neuron surrounding area, and then uh, it will increase the uh, Oxygen hormodynamic response, hormodin uh, her, uh, concentration of hormo her, uh, hemoglobin, uh, oxygen hemoglobin in this region, and in the, at the same time, the deoxy hemoglobin is reduced because of oversupplied oxygen, and the ratio change of to these two hemoglobins will lead to the distortion in the magne magnetic field around within this region, and this this change could be captured by MR scanner to generate the MR signal. Let, let's have a look. Why we need functional part? Because we know that the fMRI does not manage the manage the neural activity directly. And actually, the neural activity is project on the neural activity signal is project project on the blood flow signal and then to the ratio change between two different uh, homoglobins and then to the uh, uh, magnesium change. Finally, we got this signal through a lot of, process, a lot of st uh, several steps of process. And um, we have to say there are some many uncertainty during this procedure because uh, the, 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 the physiology meaning of both signals is not very clear, so sometimes um, the interpretation of both signals is very hard. Uh, for PET, we can give a more close metabolism measurement because we know that uh, oxygen and, new, and glucose are major uh, energy source of the neuron, and the neuron itself does not reserve any energy. So when neural activity happens, they need oxygen and uh, uh, glucose supply, supply from surrounding uh, tissues. And uh, for PET, by giving a specific tracer F18, FDG, we can monitor the distribution of uh, glucose inside the brain. So we can have a very close uh, measure of the measurement of neural activity at this stage. And uh, by using simultaneous PET fMRI scanner, we have the opportunity to explore the association between both and the glucose metabolism. It's very important and can help us to better understand how brain works. Here are some uh, quick review of a uh, PET scan. PET actually is a nuclear imaging technique to measure the metabolic process in human body by giving a uh, different radioactive tracer. After inject a radioactive tracer, the patient quietly lay on the table of scanner and, uh, and when um, uh, radioactive decay occurs, a pair, a pair of ray a pair of gamma ray is released approximately opposite directions, and this is called a line of response. This event can be captured by the surrounding detectors. And uh, we know after required this line of response, we know that actually there's a decay happening along these lines, but we don't know the exact location of the decay. So, which means we have to get a lot of lines response to generate the 
uh, radioactive trace distribution in the body, in the human body. And some new techniques such like uh, time of flight can narrow down the searching area of the locations, but still cannot provide the specific locations for the decay. Uh, so it's generally, the pattern imaging reconstruction is very computational demanding because we need to process uh, millions of lens response or even more in one image. Here is uh, uh, data we call the Lismo data we acquired from the PET scanner in most, in most uh, uh, modern PET machines. Here's the demonstration. And uh, for each lens response, the time this model that can, can be considered as a time series data for each line of response, it has a unique timestamp and some coordinatory information and other information like the energy information, something like that. Uh, the coordinate information here is now the location of the distribution. And the location of the decay is actually the coordinatory information for the detectors. Then we can convert this to our traditional sinogram files and then later we we get an image, or alternatively, the, uh, we can recount the image directly from this small data. And uh, let's see what is functional path. Functional, before talking about the functional path acquisition, let's, let's have a look at the two different things. First one is uh, in, in terms of path reconstruction, we have two different approaches. One is static, one is the dynamic. Static approach, we just get the all line of response to generate one pet image. So, which means we don't have any temporal information inside this image. But, but the spatial resolution for this pet image is really good because we have enough line of response. Uh, alternatively, we can segment this line of response. We can sub subdivide this divide this line of response, uh, the, 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 this line of response you into several segments and reconstruct this image to generate a time series of PET images. And this, we call it dynamic PET images. And we have some, definitely we have some temporal information in dynamic PET, but for each 10 points, for each frame, the spatial resolution is really poor because we don't have enough temporal uh, line of response in each of frame. And um, kind of another thing is the uh, injection, radioactivity injection methods. We have two different methods. Traditionally, we usually use a bolus injection, which means we inject the uh, old radioactive tracer at once before scanning, and we wait. For, uh, we have to wait for 10 to 20 minutes before start scanning starting. And another method is called a uh, continuous infusion. We inject uh, the uh, radioactive, radioactive tracer continuously into the uh, patient body from the beginning to the end of PET scan. Uh, combine the dynamic and the continuous fusion together, we have a, a functional PET. This is a very new technique uh, proposed about uh, in 2014, and the several groups has, uh, have already repeated these results to get, uh, repeat this method to get some very promising results to interpret the dynamic change, especially for the glucose dynamic change in the human brain. Uh, here is the example of uh, f pet signal. Uh, this is a uh, Dynamic f based on based on 100 m bulk FDG injection uh, over 95 minutes scan, and uh, the first 10 frames are removed because of very low dose, very low very low count in the PET image, and we can find that the dynamic PET image actually shows us shows an increasing trend because we believe this is a accumulation effect uh, in the uh, uh, of, of FDG, so the f time, here is demonstration of f time activity curve. The blue one is a uh, voxel from the uh, uh, gray matter region, and the red one is a voxel from uh, white matter region. We can find that uh, for both voxels, that shows a, a ramp function like a, a accumulation trend, and the blue one, the gray matter has faster accumulation than the uh, what matter? This difference actually generates a contrast of the FPAT image. And compared to the FPAT, 
compared to the fMRI time activity, we can find that fMRI is usually a fluctuation signal. iPad is not, because we believe iPad is should be a baseline plus activation, so we will generate something like that, something uh, some curve like that. Another difference that uh, if we ignoring the echo time for fMRI, we can roughly think the fMRI time signal is an instantaneous signal, which means uh, at, each point, uh, at each time point reflect the signal, uh, instantaneous signal at this time. But for PIT is different. PIT actually is a signal, it's the average signal of our time span, which means in this case, if we, in this case is for at uh, uh, 60 minutes, so actually, it's with one minute spinning, one minute spinning temporal resolution is average signal over this one minute. So this is a major difference between the fMRI and the fat signal in terms of the signal from signal processing perspective. And this is very important. So we cannot simply, for example, if we want to change the uh, temporal resolution of pad, we cannot simply consider this a, a down sampling or up sampling procedure that are different because it, it is not instantaneous signal. And let's have a look at the analysis of methods of iPad signal. Currently, there are two different kinds of signal. One is a GLM analysis, and several uh, publications has, have uh, dem uh, demonstrated that it's uh, very effective in the task of pad. And another one is a data-driven pad method, which is, uh, for example, like a uh, ISA methods. And um, in, uh, more next year, in MBI, we recently focused on the development of the ICA analysis on FPAT. And uh, first, of all, let's have a look of the GRM methods in existing literatures. Uh, in this literature, we it's based on the task design. It's about on the task FPAT, uh, task FPAT experiment. We have a uh, in task design have two different tasks. One is a finger typing task, one is a checkerboard task, and they are uh, alternatively running during the whole scan, 90 minute scan. And uh, the hypothesis is that, or we have a baseline signal for, and the uh, baseline signal, the, the total signal is baseline plus the uh, uh, activation signal. So we have something like that, this is a regressor design before get the regress of baseline, we use um, GLM fitting to fit the whole data to get a GLM. We use this data, to GLM fitting of the baseline, we use this fittings to simulate or to simulate the baseline signal of the brain. So we have three different regressors, baseline, the blue one is finger typing, the green one is eye, uh, the, the checkerboard stimulation. Then we use GLM to fit the data, for the whole brain data, uh, 40 data uh, based on one minute temporal resolution. Uh, this is a demonstration of the finger typing activity. We can successfully uh, validate actually our, the, 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 the hypothesis about the, uh, the data is actually the baseline plus the uh, uh, activity. The activity it looks like a staircase, the staircase function. Here's some more results, and uh, we have we can successfully retrieve three. Uh, we can successfully retrieve two activation maps for Virgil for the uh, checkable stimulation, and the finger typing and the fitting is is perfect. And here is the baseline activity. Uh, fitting results, it demonstrates that for different regions, uh, the baseline functions are different. The elegant the result for this case is very elegant and uh, it shows some very good results in task I've had. But we have to think about in task I've had, we have a strong stimulation, which means we can have a uh, fast, uh, very, uh, relative fast accumulation, uh, FDG accumulation in the targeted region. But for resting case, we don't have some, we don't have this uh, stimulation. And of course, we don't have the design model. So we cannot use a, 
uh, uh, use the JLM in resting resting FI study. So we try to seek seeking another methods, uh, pure data driven methods. We use IC in this case for special for for running IC on the. We obviously we cannot run IC on top of the you by using the, by just fitting the raw data of pad because we can find that we have some baseline signal baseline signal is very similar everywhere so which means it has very high correlation in this within the brain so we have to do some pre processing to remove this baseline signal or reduce the uh, correlation within the the voxel correlation within the brain so firstly we just uh, apply a mask on special temporal metrics, and then we support a propose, uh, we propose a methods just use a spatial standardization methods to remove the baseline. Basically, we just run the Z, uh, Z standardization for each time point. And uh, for example, I can give an example. This is a voxel for time cleave curve for 95 minutes, 80 minutes uh, from our past study, and then we remove the gray code, uh, the baseline, we will generate some some sort of fluctuation signal very similar to the fMRI. So then we fit in this signal into the uh, uh, conventional ICA, we can get some results. Here is example of the pre-processed 4D FPAD. We can find that the uh, accumulation trend is gone. We just saw some fluctuation like, like, like we saw in the, like, like we see in the fMRI signal. Uh, before starting applied the mice on the in vivo data, we do some experiment. We design two different experiments. The first one, we simulate the uh, uh, activation, repeat, we simulate repeated activation with uh, same intense. This is a staircase of activation on top of the baseline signal. And uh, we generate a dynamic signal for 300 frames. And we run the, we use our purpose, we, by using our proposed methods, we run IC on top of that. We can successfully extract the region we, uh, we targeted. And here's the time course. The, we can interpret this time course can be considered as uh, during the time uh, during the activation we have an increasing this is actually the relative change of the because it's this course it's a relative change of this uh, the, this regions so, and then during the resting we have a decline because uh, the increase of the mean values of the voxels and uh, we can extract uh, the temporal information and uh, spatial information successfully in this case. As another another uh, uh, experiment, we designed two different uh, stimulations. The first one is the sort of relative flight, which means to uh, which used to simulate the uh, light in, light light stimulation. Then follows a very strong stimulation. In spatial maps, we can successfully get the uh, activation. And from time call, time, uh, from time calls, we can look, we can find the difference between the uh, l low intense stimulation and the strong stimulation. So it, this is, uh, simulation results that uh, demonstrates effective of the FSA on the uh, FPAS signal. Here is a task design, for, uh, involved task design and provided by the Shana, and it's based on the uh, checkerboard, the traditional checkerboard design. Uh, for 19 minutes scanning, we have uh, several task stimulation, checkerboard task stimulation, full checkerboard, half, half, and full. Within the first full checkerboard, in the first two minutes, we have a stationary checkerboard showing to 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 ensure the to ensure the stimul uh, uh, FDG signal to reach its peak, and then followed by a 12, 16, and 72 second 72 seconds of alternating uh, alternating off and on checkerboard to give a very strong stimul uh, stimulus uh, stimulus on the virtual cortex. So in this case, we expect a very low stimulation during the first two minutes and followed by strong stimulation for the last eight minutes. Uh, for SPAS study, we just use the first, first full checkerboard data 
and we can find that we can find that for seven subject, we can successfully extract the activation maps and the time calls, and the time calls reflect the design uh, task designs. In the fir first two minutes, the stimulation strength is much lower than the following six following six minutes. After two after seven or eight minutes, it's it enter into a very steady state. So we believe maybe it's because of the fatigue of the visual cortex after several minutes uh, simulation. And this is a bike reconstruct for all bike reconstruct subjects, specific components for all seven subjects. And so such all seven subjects, we can find that for each subject, it shows a relative uh, strong uh, activation uh, in the cortex region. It demonstrates our method, the SA method, is very effective in at least in task of high, in task of high designs. And uh, and um, we now we run some joint analysis on simultaneous of my and of pied we provide two different methods the first one is called coherent ic in this case the idea is very simple we just put all the signal together to explore the coherence between these two signals and uh, we use, use some SVD reduction to reduce the dimension and you're running coherent ic the basic of coherent ic is a traditional essay on top of uh, is a um, energy balance between the fMRI signal and the uh, FI signal on top of the conventional essay, and we can extract a uh, activation spatial map and some time course. The spatial map here is some results. This activation results the spatial activation map. We believe the hybrid activation map actually is uh, uh, the region have both. Uh, both activation and FDD activation. And here is a normalized time course, and we can find that during the first two minutes, the in agreement uh, to reflect the checkerboard design, the design diagram. In the first two minutes, actually, the stimulation intense uh, quite gen uh, quite light. And in another case, we we do re investigate FI and FMI design in the resting state case. In this case, we propose a method, a very new method we just proposed and submit to the this year's uh, SMRI. It's called spatial temporal asso associate between FMI and FI. The this left left is a FM. FMI say components just running based on eight subjects. Each subject has a uh, six uh, consecutive uh, both stations, which has uh, 10 minutes, so based on 60 minutes for each subject. We just set uh, essay numbers to the fi uh, 15, and we got this all components without sorting and selection. And we can see some very traditional components, uh, primary version, uh, and some uh, like this one actually uh, default mode. And we run the proposed I say on rising of pi data with 20 second temporal resolution uh, uh, aligned to the six uh, aligned to the fMRI data. The, in terms of the time spline. So we set up the components to 10 because it's components. And then we have to make sure, just want to investigate the associate between this, association between these two different image modalities. We cannot just simply say actually, for example, we can see some uh, uh, activation during the, in the primer version, we just say, oh, okay, they are the same, uh, this simple, uh, this simple overlap, overlapping comparison cannot get, give our uh, um, very confident information. So we, uh, because we get both information, just use uh, spatial information, not enough. So we design this method to follow using both information and and uh, temporal information, temporal information based on four stage cross modality. Uh, regression method approach to finally generate a. Uh, a social matrix, and this is a social matrix. Uh, actually, uh, all temporal information, and spatial information of pi diaphragm are project on this social matrix. 
And uh, here is the result. This one actually is uh, uh, our social, uh, our proposed methods. The social index from the high social index means a very strong association between the two different groups. The, this is uh, uh, x axis. X axis is the number of f pi components, and the y axis is the number of f pi components. For example, in this case, which means the first component of pi and five pi shows very strong connections, and same as the uh, seven to four, and uh, uh, so on. And this is our results. This is a simple overlapping comparison, just use the spatial overlapping comparison results. We can find some difference. We can actually get some uh, two more, uh, two more, uh, two more associate, associate, associate components and remove one. And one is muted from our results. So here is the uh, associate, associate index and uh, components be, uh, between uh, associate index and uh, it's uh, so, uh, between the fMRI and FPAD. These two more have identified, and this is why it is muted from our uh, purpose methods. This result is very interesting and shows some to investigate the association between the fMRI and FPAD. And uh, let's have a look some the this have a discussion about the future development of simultaneous fMRI and FPAD. The first problem is that for the fMRI, the time resolution is quite high, it's really at second level, but for PAD, and currently existing literature just uses one minute time resolution. In this case, we set up Step, set up time resolution for resting to 20 seconds, but compared to the FPAD, the fMRI is still a lot of difference, cannot be matched. So I just want to show some very interesting initial results. This is uh, based on the, this is for the conventional pad reconstruction, actually for one 20 seconds uh, time resolution, we can find that image quality for each frame is really poor. And we propose some different binning method that we call the uh, overlapped method and so show some very initial results. And as I said, but the results is, looks good, but it's very initial, we still need to identify. We can find that. We can play it again. We are praising that the image quality is much, much better than the previous one. And here's a steady comparison. We can see a very clear structure in our purpose methods. So this, this results are very promising. We hope to further increase the time resolution of FPAD. And there's another problem of PAD is uh, uh, the accurate the baseline estimation. If we, in this case, we just use some spatial normalization. So I have to say the baseline remove method is it's imperfect. So if we can get a more accurate baseline remove methods, we can get a better quality of our pad signal as well. Another one, another direction is optimal tracer inject optimal the tracer injection protocol, and which means we want to explore the uh, better the, the, the optimal those and optimal rejection methods. Currently, Shana and Phil is working on this direction. And finally, we have can we can explore the inside relationship between bold and glucose metabolism if we can get a uh, good quality of signal. For example, we can explore the dynamic negativity between them and so on. And uh, finally, we can consider about some characteristics beyond FDG. For example, maybe we can use FO15, but it's very challenging because the uh, um, uh, half life of, uh, of 15 is very short, but uh, after install the new Sectron, we have the opportunity to do this. And here's some summary of the today's presentation. Uh, we show that FPAD is a dynamic pad image technique based on the continued infusion of FDG to explore the dynamic change, dynamic change of FDG in the brain. And FPAD signal represents the accumulation of FDG and it's not instantaneous, instantaneous signal. The FDG activity can be interpreted as a fluctuation by our spatial standardization, which means it's equivalent to remove the baseline. 
And uh, the assay has been pro proved effectively in the task I've had, and as well, some, re some initial, result, initial result suggests it's effective in resting state as well. And I give some drone analysis methods, and this method shows very interesting results. And I just want to thank thanks all these guys, Shana and Ward give, uh, give, give me some decoding of the results and uh, Francisco and ya Yakubu helped me set up the motion correction and uh, attention correction in PyTricon. And Richard and Alex gave a lot of help for data reconstruction. And I have to uh, special give my thanks, uh, give my thanks to Marlene, Jolly and Gary, uh, all my bosses, and uh, they gave me a lot of resource and support in this um, study. All right, thank you very much. I'll open the floor to questions. Do we have any questions for Sheng Pen? Um, yeah. A little technical question, I suppose. Yes. Um, uh, you showed us a little time series of, I think from a voxel, was it? Yeah, yeah, okay. there's one voxel. Um, time, time curve does that mean you're using, when you're removing the baseline, are you doing it on a voxel-wise basis? No, 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 no. on the spatial, uh, on the, uh, voc not, not voxel-wise basis, I get the signal from spatial, I get the voxel of all brain signals and for, and the, run. So the, the signal globally? Globally, it. yeah, globally, and uh, run the standardization on top of the signal to get the Z scores, to interpret the original signal as the Z scores. And, and so that... So then the, I generate the... So time the signal. voxels that find their way into the global signal would be all, all of the voxels in the brain, white matter, gray matter... Yes, everything. Yeah, everything. Everything. Yeah, everything in the brain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do we, do we have any other questions? Yes. Um, I, I guess the um, the joint analysis part is very interesting. Um, that's what the simultaneous MR PET scanner yeah. bring us to. Right? Would you be able to uh, elaborate on um, what the joint analysis analysis based on simultaneous MR PET can do compared with conventional techniques? You can't do. Oh yes, the major difference between the conventional technique because we have to get the pad and fMRI separately, so we lost the temporal coherence. Lost temporal coherence during these two scans. We by using the simultaneous pad fMRI, the temporal information of pad fMRI as a as a, a coherent, so we can get more information from this. The, 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 this, uh, these two modality images, we can explore the coherence between the pod and fMRI. We can, maybe we can generate some connectivity or some different, uh, do different approach to explore more information than the conventional separation, conventional separated acquisition. I have one, one, oh, yeah, one last yeah. question. So, um, using that information that you've just described, yeah. you investigated the, um, I guess, uh, the level of correlation between the signals you were measuring across the brain yeah. to, to produce those various um, components yeah. independently with the bold data and, and the uh, FDG data. Yes. And, and were able to, to show some overlap of the respective components. Yeah. But I guess... Um, there was also, um, like for instance, the default mode network was only partially. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Do you think? I know it's it's a difficult question to answer on, and it's early days. But do you think? Do you think this indicates some important differences between what the respective measures are delivering, or do you think it could potentially just be uh, a signal to noise issue for the pet? data at the moment? Uh, it's very hard to say at this stage because at this stage the signal, the SNL passing is very low. So we have to run, we have set up a very, uh, very large Gaussian smooth kernel. In this case, the Gaussian smooth kernel is 15 millimeters. It's quite large and we generate a signal. And 
uh, according to the data, it's just uh, the deformance now overlap between the, we can find that between the fMRI and fPi. And so it may suggest uh, we only, this may suggest uh, FDG acquisition has a strong FDG uh, acquisition during this region, and there's no, maybe it suggests there's a spontaneous fluctuation in FMI in both, but it's, at this stage, it's, it's too early to say, but yeah. On top of that, we can find this. Yeah, it yeah. is interesting, though, isn't it, that it, in each of the pet components, yeah. it's a unitary region as opposed to distributed regions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. probably because of a large smoothing kernel fat. And the, so the next step, I'm, I'm talking to increase time resolution as well and increase uh, image quality and some results that showed before yes. very promising, but still need to give more validation on this. Signal. Okay. Yeah. And are there any other questions? Well, it just uh, remains for all of us to thank both of our speakers today. Thank you both very much. Thank you.